Thank you. So um, I do have a conflict of interest to declare. We've re received support from 180 Therapeutics, which is a small biotech based in Boston. So we've heard about this, the myofibroblast in Dupuytren's disease, and early disease nodules have lots and lots of myofibroblasts. But in fact, there's also other cells which we haven't talked about. So what we did was we took Dupuytren's nodules from patients undergoing fasciectomy, we disaggregated them and looked for, for the cells. And when you do the fax analysis, about 90% of them are myofibroblasts, but there's in fact quite a lot of both classically and alternatively activated macrophages, which on histological staining are present throughout the nodule. Now, cells can be quite difficult to target, but what they produce would be quite interesting. So what we then did was we took all of these freshly disaggregated cells, so the whole mix of the myofibroblasts, the inflammatory cells, and kept them in culture for 24 hours. So this is the same sort of experiment that my colleagues Finula Brennan and Mark Feldman did at, the, at our institute, which identified TNF as a therapeutic target for rheumatoid arthritis. And what we found was variable levels of TGF, but a mean of about 250 picograms per ml, around 80 picograms of per ml of TNF, lots of IL-6, sufficient GM CSF to account for these macrophages. So we then looked at each of these cytokines in turn to see what effect they had on various cell types. So first we looked at TGF-beta, and when we add it to Palmer fibroblasts from Dupuytren's patients, they become more contractile. If you take normal pipe fi fibroblasts from, from um, Palmer fibroblasts from normal individuals, they behave in the same way as do non-Palmer fibroblasts from Dupuytren's patients. So this is predictable. TGF-beta added to any fibroblast from any system will make them into myofibroblasts. And if you inhibit TGF-beta, you get a decrease in contractility of myofibroblasts, as well as down regulation in the phenotype, both at, at messenger RNA and at protein level. We then looked at TNF, and this was quite interesting. Palmer fibroblasts from Dubitron's patients became more contractile at 100 picograms per ml, and if you recall back the, one of the previous slides, I showed you that those, those ex vivo experiments, we found about that level being secreted. And we looked over, at, over at a log range of cells, and in fact, there was autoregulation. It was about the same amount of TNF being produced ex vivo. Palmer fibroblasts from normal individuals and non palmer fibroblasts from Dupuytren's patients became less contractile, but at much higher levels. So there is this separation in, in the behavior of the cell types. So we were then very interested to know what happens if you take a myofibroblast from Dupuytren's patients and expose it to anti-TNF. They become less contractile. They express less messenger RNA for, these, for the alpha smooth muscle actin and collagen 1, less protein, and the cells disassemble their alpha smooth muscle actin, which accounts for this. We've heard a lot about this, wind signaling and Dupuytren's disease. I'm not going to take you through all the data, but we went on to show crosstalk between the TNF signaling pathway and effectively what the TNF was doing, but only in the Palmer fibroblast from Dupuytren's patients and not in the other cell types. It was inhibiting GSK3 beta, which led to preservation of beta catenin. And so in this, the canonical wind signaling pathway, you get translocation to the nucleus where it participates in terms of transcription of these genes. And it's also involved in the cell cytoskeleton with these adherence junctions. So we then looked at the effect of the clinically approved anti-TNF agents in Dupuytren's myofibroblasts, and they were all effective, but the most effective were these two at the doses tested of, these are the fully human IgG molecules, and this is the dose response for galimumab. So why target TNF? So we've heard about how you should culture the cells on matrix, but actually, look what happens when you study primary cells. So I've shown you these data before, TNF at around 80 picograms per ml, about 250 picograms of TGF. Go to passage two, by which time all the inflammatory cells have disappeared, almost no TNF, but through autocrine secretion by these myofibroblasts in culture, threefold increase in TGF beta. So we have to look at these primary cell cultures to really figure out what's going on. And these data may go some way to explaining these findings essentially failure of all late phase clinical trials for any form of fibrosis where TGF beta has been targeted. So we are very fortunate, it's anti-TNF that, that seems to be a, uh, a potential therapeutic. It's got an excellent safety profile. 
We know the adverse effects, which are very uncommon. We can mitigate the risk of rare infections by, by pre-screening. Uh, and subcutaneous administration seems to be pretty well tolerated. So our plan is to take patients with early disease and inject the nodules with anti-TNF. So we're now proceeding to a clinical trial funded by the Wellcome Trust and the Department of Health in the UK with drug funded by 180 Therapeutics, initially with a dose ranging study and then followed by a randomized trial in patients with early disease with anti-TNF and placebo. So I'd like to finish by thanking the fantastic team I've got, my collaborators, Dom Davidson and Dominic Furness, and our funding bodies. Thank you. Thank you.